Welcome to On Deck with the Cats, the official show of the Ketua Kettleers, taking you through everything happening around Lowell Park and all throughout the village. Now here is your Ketua media team for this episode of On Deck with the Cats. Hello, Ketua fans, and welcome into episode six of On Deck with the Cats, the official show of the Ketua Kettleers. I'm Tim Crowley, your senior media intern, joined by a panel of my friends for the summer today, starting with our broadcasters, Chris and Stephen Carey, and also joining us, our research and development intern, Will Thompson. Yeah, happy to be here, Tim. Thanks so much for having us on. Really excited for today's show. Yeah, I'm super excited, super excited to be here and excited to break down the MLB, of course, with the season just getting underway. A lot of great baseball to get into. Tim, super excited to be here, echoing the other two sentiments. Well, it's great to see everybody's faces again. And as we get closer to baseball season, we're now just about two months away from opening day in the Cape League. But as we meet here today, the first week of the Major League Baseball season now in the books, it's been a very exciting first week of baseball. And just so happy to see this game back in 2021 with fans in the stands, especially. That's read a ton of energy back in the stadiums. That's been awesome to see across the country. But one storyline that we're going to focus on quite a bit in today's episode is all the Kettleers that we've been able to see so far in 2021 across Major League Baseball. And a few that we're going to highlight today we'll be going through over the next part of this episode, as well as we're going to be ending the show. Chris, Stefan, Will, and I all going around with our predictions for the postseason as well as individual awards. So plenty to go through on this MLB preview edition of On Deck with the Cats. So guys, let's start with the players that we're going to see, former Kettleers in the show. And let's start out in Anaheim with Jared Walsh, who burst onto the scene. He's been a talk of the town in Anaheim, especially after his big walk-off home run against the White Sox on Sunday Night Baseball. What have you guys seen from our first Kettleer, our first former Kettleer on the show? Well, Jared Walsh has, he's always had the potential as far as his power at the plate. He showed it throughout the minor leagues. And especially last year, he really started to translate a lot of that power to in-game in the MLB. Of course, last season being a shortened 60-game uh, set, he didn't, he didn't get a chance to show off his power over a full 162 games, but we've really been able to see it so far. He's in the Angels lineup every day at this point. And from the left side, you mentioned his huge performance last Sunday against the Chicago White Sox, where he had two home runs, including the walk-off three-run homer to give the Angels the win. So out of all the Cataliers uh, in the MLB so far, Jared Walsh is really making a name for himself. And he's starting to become a, a popular player among the fans, that's for sure. Yeah, and you look at the small sample size he was given, 60 games, 293 average, nine home runs, 26 RBIs. And, I mean, those are no numbers to sleep at. You, you look at the position he's playing. He comes in relief of Albert Pujols at times over at first base and certainly really emerging onto the scene and being one of those really talented players out in the ALS. And not to mention, Steph, that Jared Walsh is a 2013 Cavalier, which meant that he was a champion even before he burst onto the scene. Uh, the Angel is also kind of practicing becoming a two-way positional player uh, next to Shohei Otani. We'll see how much of that action comes over in Anaheim this year. Uh, but we've been hearing that he can sling the ball. He can hit the ball. Obviously, he showed that on Sunday Night Baseball uh, quite a few days ago. And one of my favorite aspects of Jared Walsh is that he is a University of Georgia alumni. So can't go wrong with that, guys. You knew our Bulldog had to sneak that in on our first kid, former Ketua former Kettleer that we're going to talk about on the show. Just talked about one of the guys out in Anaheim. Now two former Angels making their way back out to the East Coast and into the Ketua region just a little bit with the Red Sox. We're going to start with the first of two coming to Boston in 2021. The first being, being Garrett Richards entering that Red Sox starting rotation on a one-year deal for $10 million. Will, we'll start with you. What have you seen from Richards so far in 2021? Well, first of all, it's good to see that Garrett Richards is healthy. Uh, he is, he's 33 years old at this point. He's been in the MLB uh, for quite some time now, but he's always had great stuff. Uh, he's always had ter terrific metrics, of course, spin rate being one of them. And especially with the Angels and even the Padres last year, he, he struggled to stay healthy. But in last year's 60-game season, finally, with the Padres, he was able to put together a full season. And he, he's really showed flashes of what he can be. 
10 starts, a 4.03 ERA, striking out uh, eight per nine. And that earned him a, bit, a, a bigger guarantee as far as his contract with the Red Sox. He, he's going to be in the rotation for most of the season. Granted, ho- hopefully he stays healthy. Uh, he had a rough start in, a, in his first outing against the Baltimore Orioles, but at least uh, last again this past Saturday against the against the Orioles, he got another start against them. He looked a lot better. He only gave up three hits over five innings. So the Red Sox, if they're going to go anywhere this year, they're going to need Garrett Richards to be that that consistent piece in the middle of the rotation. And he started to really show flashes of that in his last outing. I think it's also important to note, look at the division that he's just gone into. The AL East might be the most competitive division in all of baseball. You have the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Toronto Blue Jays, who have restocked and emerged as one of the powers in that division. So losing a game to the Orioles is something that's a little bit of concern. Obviously, it's early season uh, mishaps that we've seen, but expect him to step his game up when he starts to play more of those competitive teams in the AL East. And just to go off of what these two said, anybody that knows uh, Stefan and myself know that we are not analytically oriented um, uh, to say a few words, but this guy has incredible stuff when he's healthy. The spin rate is nothing to sneeze at. And he is going to try and revitalize his career in Boston with a team that is trying to be on the uptrend, uh, has a lot of young players and they're trying to compete for that probably wild card spot in the American League. I don't think that they're ready to just win the division yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if they could put something together at the later parts of this season. And joining Richards in Boston is going to be another former Angels t- teammate in Matt Andrees, who came over also on a free agent signing by way of the Red Sox this offseason. He started to make his mark. He was used on opening day, and he's been a frequent piece that Alex Cora has liked to go through so far in 2021, also getting a save this past weekend in Baltimore as well. So now with the second Angel, what have you guys seen from Andrees so far in Boston during his first year there? So Matt Andrees throughout his career has been the classic example of a swing man. He's been a guy who, at least when he's been a reliever, has been able to give multiple innings out of the bullpen. He's been very versatile his entire career, of course, with Tampa, Arizona, the Angels, and now the Red Sox. And this year, at least in Boston, he's starting out the year in in the bullpen. He could potentially move into the starting rotation if there's a few injuries, maybe some guys don't perform, but at least so far, he's been, he's been pretty impressive. Uh, Tim, you mentioned he picked up a save this past weekend in Baltimore, uh, at least in his first six appearances, his ERA sits right at three. So he's been, he's been impressive so far. He's been a consistent reliever starter. Like I mentioned, very versatile. And so he's been an important part of the Red Sox and he will continue to be, and you can see why uh, chief baseball officer Heim Bloom wanted to bring him in because of, his versatility. I think Andres is one of those guys that's really going to anchor the bullpen for the Red Sox. And that's going to be something that's very important for this team moving forward is how they deal with late game uh, comebacks, resurgences from the other team. I mean, I know Will's watching the game right now as we speak and having those ties, getting out to big leads, you need to be able to preserve the win as much as possible, especially in a division that's as competitive as the AL East is. And it's always good to have somebody like that in your bullpen that is so versatile that can start some games in the stretch and and others uh, can close out games for your team. And Matt Andres is definitely that personified, and that's why Heim Bloom picked him up in the offseason. So not much to say about him. He's going to be a stalwart in that bullpen or the rotation wherever he is found fit. And the Red Sox have picked up two great pitchers uh, for a pretty decent price. So we'll see what they do for the rest of the season. We've talked about a few teams in red. We just finished talking about one of the Sox in Major League Baseball. And now we're going to go to a guy that's had a little bit of experience with both. That being Bernardo Flores. Once again, another Katua Cattleyer alumni was starting the season with the Chicago White Sox and pitched for them in spring training before recently being claimed off waivers by the St. Louis Cardinals. He's been optioned to their alternate site. Stefan, we'll start with you on this one as because not only is Bernardo an alumni of the Cattleers as a whole, also an alumni of the show joined us for a really fascinating conversation on episode three of On Deck with the Cats. What were some of your biggest takeaways when we got to meet with Bernardo a few weeks ago? Well, first thing is Bernardo is an excellent guy, a huge friend of the show, and we were so happy to have him on. Great show. If you haven't listened, definitely tune in. Um, But he was so excited to be in Arizona, a kid from Southern California, getting his chance during spring training, 
yeah, he made it to the majors. He has pretty decent numbers in his couple of appearances, 3.84 career ERA as a professional. But, you know, sometimes the ball just doesn't roll the way that you want it to. And part of me has to wonder, do you think that Tony La Russa may have had a little bit of conversation with the St. Louis Cardinals when they picked him up? But surely you're, you can expect a lot of great things coming from Bernardo come, moving forward. He's still very young, got a ton in the tank. And don't be surprised if you see him pitching for the Redbirds soon. I definitely agree with that about Bernardo Flores. And especially when you see guys that are, that are claimed off waivers, there's a reason they did it, right? Because otherwise Bernardo Flores would have just gone to the alternate site off of the 40 man roster with the Chicago White Sox. There's a reason the Cardinals wanted to make sure that he was on their 40 man roster and he could potentially get a call up. And you can see why, because I mean, back in 2019, the last minor league season that we had, he was very, very good in double A, just at 23 years old. So the Cardinals clearly view him as a future major league piece. And I think that's a great thing for Flores. That's a great thing for, for his development. And uh, a change of scenery, I think, is going to benefit him a lot, actually. And Bernardo Flores is just an absolute steal. You get a clubhouse guy, somebody who has been time and time again able to show you that he can compete. He's young, he's healthy, he's ready. And he's going from one contender for their division to another. So it's a good situation for him, learning under people that know how to pitch, know how to win games, know how to increase his stock as a player, and working for a first-class organization like the St. Louis Cardinals. Again, Flores with a 3.84 career ERA as a professional, looking forward to what his future now holds in St. Louis. Going from one guy that called Arizona home to another, we'll go down to the Arizona Diamondbacks with Kevin Ginkle coming out of their bullpen. Uh, had a split little time in 2020, but now getting ready to return to the Diamondbacks in 2021. What have you seen from the bullpen piece out in Arizona? So, so Kevin Ginkle uh, is, is an interesting case because when he first came up, in 2019 in that D-backs bullpen, he was brilliant, right? In 25 appearances with them, he put up a 1.48 ERA, striking out uh, just about 10 and a half guys per nine. Uh, infor unfortunately, when we moved into 2020, a lot of guys had some off seasons, whether that part of that is, you know, in spring training or summer camp, if you wanted to call it that. You're, you're just preparing with sim games. And of course, it's not, it's not a real spring training. You saw a lot of guys struggle with that, both pitching and hitting wise, I think Ginkle could have been part of that. Uh, of course, with an ERA of 6.75 last year in 19 appearances, but Arizona's sticking with him. And so far this year, he's been really impressive. Uh, he's in, in his four appearances so far has not given up a run. So I, I think in a normal season, I think Ginkle, especially in a team like Arizona, who's struggling right now in a great division like the NL West, probably more of an, in a rebuild mode. I think Ginkle will get a, uh, will get a lot more opportunities than he would otherwise it, with the Diamondbacks. And I think that's a good thing. I think you'll see him a lot as a high leverage reliever, especially in those big games against the Dodgers and the Padres powers like that in the national league. I think that'll be fun to watch. Yeah, I think uh, small sample size is another thing to say. 60 games, you don't, obviously, as a relief arm, you're not going to appear in all of them. But, you know, over 19 games and 16 innings pitched, you mentioned it, 6.75 ERA. You don't have the extra 102 games to kind of bounce back and bolster your ERA and some of your better numbers. But you can expect that he's going to be back and ready after a little bit of work in spring training and having that comfortability. Uh, but the Diamondbacks, you know, they're going to be sort of a middle of the middle table team in the NL West. And they're certainly going to look for any win that they can get against one of the tougher divisions of baseball. Let's not forget, guys, that pitchers are creatures of habit. And in this situation in 2020, every pitcher got a wrench thrown in their routine, their cycle, however you want to call it. We'll set it best, the summer camp. When you have your routine over a consistent amount of days like a spring training, and then it just stops dramatically. Then you have to try and refocus and recycle and retune everything that you've done, especially as a reliever, where you are called upon to perform at the highest level every night and get outs, be a consistent person in that bullpen. And that's sometimes hard to translate, especially considering the extraneous variables that were removed in the bullpen or excuse me, on the field. There weren't fans. Pitchers build off of a fan base. And in Arizona and every other organization, for the most part, until the playoffs, there was nothing to build off. If it was completely quiet. They didn't have anything behind them other than their teammates. And that might have contributed to his lack of the numbers that we saw in 2019. 
We'll stay in the NL West now, moving to one of the growing fan favorites in all of baseball, that being Giants outfielder Mike Yastrzemski, another Katua Ketelier's alum, playing for them in 2011. And as our Massachusetts fans know all too well, carrying on that family legacy as the grandson of Red Sox legend Carl Yastrzemski. At 21 home runs in 2019, was able to come back to Fenway Park and hit one of those on a truly memorable night at Fenway. His four double, his four triples, I should say, in 2020 led all of Major League Baseball. He's off to a little bit of a slow start in 2021, but we know that one of baseball's young stars is certainly going to be able to turn it around and make it to a crowd here in 2021. Oh, absolutely. I think Mike Yastrzemski last year was one of the big stories in all of baseball and specifically the National League. You look at the, you look at the San Francisco Giants in general. Last year, they weren't really expected to do a whole lot. Uh, but led by Mike Yastrzemski, they really exceeded expectations. They ended up missing the playoffs, of course, with a loss on the last day of the season. It, it was a win and you're in scenario. They didn't get it done, and the Brewers took their spot in that uh, eight-team National League playoff. However, Mike Yastrzemski was – a big reason that the Giants were even in that spot at this at that point. And you mentioned he got off, he's gotten off to a little bit of a slow start this year. That's certainly true. But of course, I mean, eight games in, how many, how much can you really draw from that? But I mean, Mike Kostromsky has been a really, really fun story. Uh, he, of course, he was traded from the Baltimore Orioles to the Giants uh, for, for a minor league pitcher. Back, in tw- back before the 2018 season, I feel like the Orioles are probably regretting that one now. But I, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Mike Ustremski really start to pick it up soon as he starts to get more of his timing down and become the hitter that we've seen him be at the, at the MLB level uh, over the past couple of years. And Chris mentioned earlier about world-class organizations. The San Francisco Giants are certainly one of them. Uh, you know, they had that stretch of several World Series championships over the last two decades. And you have members on that team that sort of anchored those those games and those victories in the World Series, like Buster Posey. And then you add Evan, Longor- Evan Longoria, you have Brandon Belt. But still, you look at Mike Yastrzemski as one of those star players that really have made the Giants exciting to watch because, let's face it, the expectations for this team are not super high when the Dodgers and the Padres have loaded up as much as they have. I haven't seen a player like Mike Yastrzemski burst onto the scene like he has and has shown no sign of slowing down. Uh, The beginning of the season, we could talk about it all day, uh, especially considering every other circumstance. He's a guy that is consistent. He, He delivers when his team needs him to. And he's a guy that I know that everybody roots for, especially considering his lineage and how he plays the game. I've got nothing else to say except Katuit's lucky to have him as an alumni and so are the San Francisco Giants to have him on their team. Can't spell his name if you ask me though. It would take me about a thousand tries. We'll never be alone for that one. That's why we'll we'll keep it simple with yes, just as many people around here have for decades around the game of baseball. But we'll stay in the National League. We'll head back to the East Coast for a little bit. And as Will and I are stationed on Long Island here at college at Hofstra, we'll go to a, a city go to a ballpark just about 20 miles from here in Queens. And let's talk about the backup, the backstop tandem for the New York Mets, both coming in. We'll start with James McCann, the 2010 Katuit champion of the Cape Cod baseball league and earned himself a pretty penny with a 40 year deal worth $40 million with the New York Mets this past off season. And one of the more interesting signings of the off season heading in to this winter, all we heard a lot about the Mets was we heard a lot of the same pieces that they were going to be targeting Trevor Bauer, George Springer, JT Rumuto don't end up getting any of them, but still finding a really solid piece of McCann who's been on the rise the last couple of years has had some success in Chicago as of late. And now we've seen the Mets really finding their true backstop that they're going to want to cement as they head into their years of what we believe to be contenders over the next few seasons. Well, Tim, in a couple of cases before the players we've discussed before here on the show a change of scenery has really helped them and I think in the case of James McCann you'd be remiss to find a better uh, example of that with with the Detroit Tigers he was mostly uh, a a starter who you know he's probably like an eight nine hitter in the lineup maybe even a backup uh, at, at times but as soon as he joined the as he signed with the Chicago White Sox in 2019, I mean, he burst onto the scene, was an all-star in 2019, hit 18 home runs, hit 273, with 60 RBIs in 118 games there. And of course, 
in the abbreviated 2020 campaign, he was he was outstanding in 31 games with an OPS nearly at 900. So unfortunately, injuries cut his season short there. But you could see why the Mets were really looking at him as an upgrade over over Wilson Ramos at the time. Of course, defensively, McCann it was certainly certainly an upgrade over Wilson Ramos, and I think that's why the Mets wanted to bring him in. Gotten off to a little bit of a slow start offensively, like a lot of the Mets lineup has to this point. Uh, but James McCann, I mean, him, him and Yaz are similar in the sense that they, they really started to break out in that age 29, 30, uh, those seasons. And I think that's, that's pretty unique uh, for guys like that. But James McCann, there's a reason he, the Mets committed four years to him, and he's certainly the guy in Queens. Well, and as a Braves fan, I have to be scared about how much the Mets have reloaded as an organization, and they're they're being really aggressive. Um, we were talking to Ron Darling on one of our former shows, and he was speaking about the Mets, and he didn't realize that James McCann was a former Cataleer. So when we told him that, he was really excited, and he said, well, I'm going to root even harder for James McCann because of that. But even so, you look at Mets catchers of the past, Mike Piazza, and they're trying to find that stable guy behind the dish for them that can really help them win championships and become a top tier team in the NL East and beyond. I'm not suggesting that James McCann's that guy yet. That would be a uh, heresy to even suggest at this point, but goodness, you have to look out for all the things that he brings to the table. They wanted JT real Muto. They found the next best thing and there's no question about it. Will mentioned uh, the difference or similarities I might say with James McCann and Yaz I would like to point out a different Yaz, Yasmani Grandal, who he split time with last year, and a catcher that not very many catchers would be able to put up the numbers that James McCann did with a guy like Yasmani Grandal right next to him uh, with that job. 289 average, seven home runs, 15 RBIs in uh, the abbreviated season. Just ridiculous numbers for a guy that was usually considered a more defensive catcher, but that's why he got the big contract at four years, 40 million with New York. Steve Cohen and that entire organization is lucky. And with that pitching staff and that bat and his defensive abilities, you're getting a primo guy with multiple tools behind the dish. And for the days that McCann will not be starting for the Mets, we'll be looking at the four, the other catcher that the New York has brought in. Also another Cadillac alum in Caleb Joseph had also spent some time in the AL East with the Orioles and the Blue Jays. So starting to find that little bit of a pipeline. I guess this is where uh, we go from Ketuit to Queens. But for the days we won't see McCann, what can the Mets expect from a guy like Caleb Joseph? So I think, I think Mets fans can certainly expect uh, defense as far as Caleb Joseph. That's been his calling card for a long time. Uh, of course, when he was the catcher uh, with the Baltimore Orioles backing up Matt Wieters. And, uh, and he started and he's bounced around a little bit. Uh, with the Diamondbacks in 2019 and played a few games with Toronto last season in 2020. So I think you're going to have a guy, he's been around, uh, he's been around the game for many years. He knows how to call a game. That's, of course, it's very, very important. And so as far as Joseph, you're going to get a really good defensive catcher. That's going to, that's his calling card. And especially uh, as he continues to get into those age 35, 36 seasons, that's why teams continue to bring him in, even though the offensive production isn't that of like a James McCann. Uh, so that's definitely why the Mets brought him in, a veteran guy to work with some of the young pitchers on the staff. And I think that's what you'll continue to see out of Caleb Joseph this year. Yeah, no, absolutely right, Will. I mean, we talk about this and how important catchers are defensively. If you have a catcher that's a defensive liability, He's just not going to be able to play. I mean, you look at the Braves, which, of course, they're going to be the team that I reference the most because I've spent the most time watching them. But we had Tyler Flowers as a backup to Brian McCann and then, of course, last year to Travis Darno, And he was a guy that would come in. He wouldn't provide a ton of offense, but he was stable behind the plate. That's what you're asking for. And you look at the experience with Baltimore and the years that Caleb Joseph has been in the league. He's going to provide a wealth of knowledge and he has an arsenal to work with. I mean, Jacob deGrom, Marcus Stroman, Noah Syndergaard, when he comes back from injury, all those guys are tools that most catchers would be licking their chops to have the ability to call games for. Steph hit it right on the nail. Uh, this is the new model for catchers in major league baseball. You've got your one dominant 
hitter who is good defensively. And then another guy who's really good at calling a game. Steph alluded to Tyler Flowers with the Braves, even beforehand when Kurt Suzuki was coming in with Atlanta. Uh, the, the Dodgers have it as well with Will Smith and Austin Barnes. I mean, a lot of teams are starting to employ this model for their teams. And even beforehand, James McCann was that guy. He was Caleb Joseph for the White Sox with Yasmani Grandal. And it's almost like the script flipped because of how well he did in that system. And the Mets are hoping that they can get that production out of both James McCann and Caleb Joseph. We just talked about a player with some White Sox experience. We'll go to another in Zach Collins, a 2015 Cadillac as well. And that class of Ketua baseball really starting to make their way through the major leagues, as we'll talk about throughout the, re the rest of this show. What can we expect from Collins here in 2021? So Zach Collins has been a guy that scouts have been raving about for years, not only for his ability behind the plate, but for his bat. Uh, he hasn't had a, a ton of chances so far in the big leagues, of course, still only 26 years old. He's only played uh, 40 games at the big league level to this point. He shot, um, he's hit four home runs in those 40 games. So not, not great numbers offensively so far, but the minor league numbers are there. You can see why scouts have loved him. I mean, you look at in 2019 when he was not in the big leagues with the Chicago White Sox in AAA Charlotte. I mean, play, I'm a guy who absolutely loves guys who can walk. And Zach Collins is that guy. In 88 games in AAA at age 24, hit 282 with 19 home runs with an on base of 403. If you have a catcher that can get on base at a 403 clip, not to say he's necessarily going to do that at the major league level, but he, he's shown he can get on base and he has pop. He's definitely more of an offensive catcher. Uh, and there's a reason that the White Sox were all right with letting a guy like James McCann walk because they had faith in a guy like Zach Collins to come in behind him, play a lot. Uh, and of course he, he's also DH'd at times this year to try and get his bat into the lineup when Grandall is behind the plate. So Zach Collins is a guy that baseball fans really should be watching out for uh, in many positions. He'll play a little first base as well, but he's a really interesting guy and um, his bat is really going to play at the big league level. We, I've just got to, you just got to hope that, uh, his great numbers in the minor leagues can really translate to the big leagues that they necessarily ha that they haven't necessarily yet, but I really do think it's coming. Yeah, I mean, and look at how young he is. You mentioned 26 years old. He's on one of the top contenders in the league right now. If you look at just on paper, who the best teams are, the White Sox are certainly up there. He's going to learn so much from Yasmani Grandal, from all the different bats, from the personnel that are in the White Sox clubhouse. And I think you're going to see a star emerge in the next couple of years when the White Sox call his name and start to have him get consistent plate appearances and consistent starts. And I don't want to jump the gun here and, and say that it's not about him getting hits, but I don't know if that's necessarily the most important statistic for him this season, considering that he is behind Yasmani Grandal and another person that's listed as a catcher that has basically cemented himself as the everyday designated hitcher, hitter in uh, your mean Mercedes. Uh, Zach Collins is probably going to be that backup catcher who can call a game well, play the days off for Yasmani Grandal. And if he can hit above a 200 clip on the season, then it's all beautiful for the White Sox. And I think they should be happy with that. So we'll go back now to a guy that's been a favorite Inca to it since the day he came here in 2012, that being Tony Kemp, as we mentioned, again, playing for this team in 2012 and had a great year last year, especially in the community as a 2020 Roberto Clemente Award nominee with the Oakland A's. We remember his time in the AL West as well with the Houston Astros made a plenty of plays in the 2018 American League Championship Series down at Minute Maid Park, having that catch against the wall against Steve Pierce, taking Rick Porcello deep for a home run, had himself quite the series, and now calling Oakland home. He's off to a little bit of a slow start in 2021, but we know that his defensive presence and his effort in the community of Oakland certainly making Kemp a wonderful piece to that A's community, that A's organization. For sure. I think when you look at Tony Kemp, you have a guy who's able to play everywhere uh, on the diamond, uh, mid a middle infielder as well. Primarily, I guess I would say mostly at second base, but he can also play the outfield as well. You've seen the teams he's played on in the past, of course, being the Astros uh, winning a World Series with them in 2017, the Astros, the Cubs, and now with the A's. He's going to play. He's going to play all over the diamond. Uh, he's he's going to provide um, a, a good amount of speed. 
Uh, and so he's really just a solid player for the Oakland A's, a guy who they can feel comfortable sticking in the lineup uh, every day at whatever position they might need. And that's how he's been utilized throughout his career and probably how they're going to continue to, to utilize him with the athletics. And whenever I see a guy that comes and that is desired by the Oakland athletics, I want to take a second look at him, right? It's kind of like the Western version of the Tampa Bay Rays. They like guys that, you know, haven't necessarily emerged yet, but they see the potential and yeah, Kemp has won just about every award that he can win, but he has five tools. He plays the game the right way. He has the ability to provide so many different assets to the Oakland A's organization who's hung around in the AL West. They have defied the expectations year after year and become one of the top teams in that division most years. All I'll say is speed kills. If you can bring speed on the base paths and you can also be having good, reliable defense in multiple positions, teams aren't going to look away from you. They're going to open you and try and figure out how they can get you. And the Oakland Athletics have gotten Tony Kemp, who can play multiple positions and offer something to their team that isn't expected to do as well as they did last year, but have surprised people over the last three years. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them vying for a wild card spot in the American League once again. You talked about that 2015 Kettle Leaders team just a little bit ago. We'll continue on uh, with another Katuit alum in Justin Dunn, former first round pick out of Boston College. It looked pretty solid last year, Had showed some sides, had you know 7.5 strikeouts per nine. He's going to be entering his third year with the Seattle Mariners organization. What can we see from the former right hander that started his days at Katuit? So, Justin Dunn, you mentioned him, of course, a first round pick. I should, I should tell you, he, he was a top prospect throughout his time in the minors. And of course, uh, went during his days in college and in Katuit, of course, he's always been highly thought of by scouts. He has great stuff. Uh, but of course, he, he's now with the Seattle Mariners, came up with the Mets, was traded, uh, was traded to Seattle in that Edwin Diaz, Robinson Cano trade. Uh, that I'm sure Mets fans just absolutely love that entire the entire trade as uh, as a whole. But as far as Justin Dunn, he has good stuff. He's shown flashes, like you mentioned last year with the Mariners in those ten starts. Uh, however, command has kind of been an issue for him. We even saw that in his first start of the year in his four and two thirds innings, he only gave up one hit. Uh, but com his but his command is definitely. It, his, his command definitely has to be honed in a little bit if he's going to be a consistent starter in the big leagues, but still a young guy, still 25 years old. That can certainly happen. And the Mariners, uh, the Mariners still in a rebuild mode are certainly going to, uh, they're going to be patient with him. They're going to keep him in the starting rotation. And, and once he does figure out that command piece, I think he's a different pitcher. And I think he's going to be a, a, a mainstay in that Mariners rotation for, for years to come. Yeah, you look at his number in 2021 with ERA, he's just under 5.8. And I think across the board for relief arms, the bats have been alive throughout the MLB. So it's not as much him getting as much of the blame. It's just the hitters have been so good early in the season. And you can expect him to bounce back a little bit more from that, start to throw better pitches, work on his command. And it's just, he's young. You have to trust that he's going to grow and get better with time and with more innings pitched. Seattle's a good place for him to keep honing his craft and figuring it out. They're a team that's probably not going to be a contender this year, but have a young core, as we've said multiple times with other teams. And it's a great place for a pitcher to learn how to pitch. Chris mentioned it a few minutes ago with Tony Kemp, that narrative speed kills. Well, that fits another former Kettler we're going to talk about in Josh Harrison playing for the Cats in 2007 and had himself a pretty solid 2020 with the Washington Nationals as well, hitting just below 280, had three home runs on the year. One of the most electrifying players that can do everything on the bases. We've all seen the videos of his electrifying pickles that he's gotten himself into and really working some magic on the Bates paths, as well as with the glove in the field. What can we expect from Josh Harrison as he continues his career? 
Tim, you mentioned it. He, Josh Harrison is an electrifying player. He has been throughout his career with the Pirates. Uh, in 2019, once he did end up leaving the Pirates and going to the Tigers, he did struggle in 2019. But he did have somewhat of a career resurgence with the Nats in 2020, hitting 278 with three home runs and 14 RBIs uh, in, in that in those 33 games. Enough for uh, him to really he's go he's in the lineup pretty much every day. For the Washington Nationals, uh, of course, they had their whole COVID, uh, their all their COVID problems. But once th that all gets straightened out, you're going to see a lot of Josh Harrison probably playing second base uh, in the nation's capital. So you can see you, you get to see a lot of fun base running. He's a solid hitter, uh, probably more of a contact guy than a power guy. But it, it, in a lineup like the Nationals, but of course, added Josh Bell and added Kyle Schwarber in the offseason, uh, guys with a lot of swing and miss in their game, a lot of, and with a, with a ton of power, of course. You need a guy like Josh Harrison in the lineup who's who's going to make contact. He's going to put the ball in play. And that's definitely the role you're going to see him in with the Nats uh, as he enters his age 32 season. Yeah, and talk about his resurgence and his career revival with Washington. We didn't know what exactly was going to happen with that. They brought him up. They came. They have him play about half the season in 2020. He puts out stellar numbers in what was an embattled infield. They lost Anthony Rendon. They needed to find some spots, some guys that could play good defense and also get them hits. And now he's back on the team as a starter in 2021, back in the National League with a little bit more comfortability, and I think it, it shows. Yeah, Steph, you make a great point. I also want to shed light on the fact that Carter Keboom didn't make the roster outright, and that proved to be a good thing for Josh Harrison, who was on the fringe for that team, now starting basically every day, moving around second base, sometimes third base. Uh, the team looks all right. Uh, Josh Harrison, obviously, like you said, an electrifying athlete. If I were the Nationals, I would view Josh Harrison similarly to how they were when they picked up Howie Kendrick. That's this comparison that I think that they would want to draw from the same guy. Not the same power that Howie Kendrick has, but he brings the same type of elements to the table five years younger than when Howie Kendrick won his World Series in 2019. So now let's take a look at another 2010 Cape League champion with the Katua Kettleers heading out to the mountains in Colorado with C.J. Crone. Also, we know he's got the pop in his bat. And when you go out to a park like Coors Field, we know how that ball travels, as we're certainly going to see with the Home Run Derby heading out there in 2021. How excited are you guys to see maybe some sort of a power revival from Crone uh, now playing at Coors Field? So when C.J. Crone, since he, since he left the Angels, he's kind of bounced around. Uh, between the Rays, the Twins, and the Tigers after that. But when I heard he was going to Colorado, I was like, yes, that is the perfect fit for C.J. Crone. You mentioned he has huge power. Of course, in 2018, when he was the everyday first baseman for the Tampa Bay Rays, he hit 30 home runs in, in, 100, in 140 games there. Uh, and, of course, with the Twins in 2019, hit 25 homers there as well. Definitely struggled in Detroit in 2020 as well. But – he, he, he's gonna he has his hold on the first base job in Colorado off to a bit of a slow start there but you mentioned Coors Field and him are a match made in heaven and it'll be interesting to see oh because I'm sure the Rockies they're definitely in a rebuild state at this point he's going to get chances he's going to get chances to cement himself uh, as the first baseman and hopefully for for the next few years for a few years there as well uh, and Especially, he is off to a slow start this year, but in the spring, he had five home runs in 19 games in the spring. So uh, I think it's only a matter of time before he starts hitting, specifically with power, the way we know he can. Yeah, I think consistent at-bats are going to be the key for C.J. Crone. Get him to the plate as much as you can. Really let him get into a rhythm. And that's what you're going to see if you're going to see the most accurate version of what kind of player C.J. Crone is. And Colorado is a really tough place to hit home runs. It's a gigantic ballpark. If you're not used to it, you have to get used to it, have to get settled in. So when he goes to spring training, plays in a smaller park, comes to Coors Field, it's going to be tougher for him to get the ball out of the yard. But he definitely has that power. He definitely has that pedigree to be one of the best hitters on this team. And yet, yeah, Colorado not going to be top of the division. Similar situation with Arizona. They're kind of a very, <laughs> I wouldn't say the same team, but they're very similar in where they finish. Um, most seasons, but expect to see them try and find some stability at all their positions over the next year or so. 
And first base has been kind of the biggest question mark for Colorado for a very long time since Todd Helton retired. And so they've had guys like Mark Reynolds come in and play there. Daniel Murphy played there for a spell over at first base, who was an everyday second baseman in every other team that he played for. So CJ Crone, who is somewhat defined as a designated hitter, if you look at the way he plays, is playing first base for them. And you have to let him settle in. You have to give him consistent at bats if you're going to get what you want out of him, if it happens. Uh, but Colorado, like you said, Tim, perfect place for him, perfect place at Coors Field. And that'll allow him to possibly uh, rebuild his career. Now we'll go back and just talk about a 2010 champion with the Cattlers. We'll go back to 2007 for another former catcher. We've talked a lot about the backstops today. We get to it, placing plenty of them across Major League Baseball. Now heading back to the nation's capital with John Gomes, who had a pretty solid shortened season in 2020 with the Nationals, hitting 284, four home runs on the season. And I know for all – no, even though we're still in Massachusetts, I'm sure across the Cape, and you know, we do have a couple of Yankees fans lying around, but I know they weren't exactly happy to see Jan Gomes with that walk-off hit against them in the American League Division Series back in 2017. What can we expect from the next batch up we'll talk about as a Katua product? So Jan Gomes has always been a plus offensive catcher, I guess more so, more so than we've seen uh, from, from the other catchers we've talked about. He's definitely more of a threat with the bat, even though uh, he is 33 years old. He, he is a veteran, a veteran catcher with, with the Washington Nationals. We mentioned their, their whole COVID, their COVID issues before. Gomes was recently activated off that list a few days ago. So once he starts to get back into the swing of things, uh, he's, a, he's a nice addition for them. Uh, he's a nice um uh, guy in their lineup at the bottom more more probably more at the bottom of the order behind a lot of those power guys that I mentioned earlier uh with the Washington Nationals so I think you're going to expect a, a guy who's probably going to hit in the 260 range uh maybe 12 like 10 to 12 to maybe 14 home runs in a good year so I, I think Jan Gomes is a guy there's a reason he keeps getting starting catching jobs uh and it's what he can do with the bat I think you'll see output similar to that this year with the Nationals. Yeah, I think when you look at his career when it started in, in Cleveland and how he's kind of continued to find those starting roles, it is certainly reflecting how good of a player that he is. Uh, but the Washington Nationals aren't shy to bring in veteran catchers. They had Kurt Suzuki the year that they won the World Series in 2019. So they trust that with age also comes a ton of knowledge, a ton of ability, and it, doesn't, it isn't a negative. It is a positive to them that they can have a guy that can call a game and also can get them hits when they need to. And I think that's exactly what Jan Gomes is going to be. I think only time will tell, guys. Uh, you know, in 2019, their World Series championship winning season, he batted 223. And yes, the numbers suggest 284 over the 60-ish games that were played during that season uh, are a positive uptrend. But you just never know. The guy bats 246 career, which is pretty good for a catcher, especially considering the way the game is moving and progressing. I think that he'll get back to his finer form. But 2019 was definitely a blemish year for him, uh, considering him sharing time, but still being the primary catcher with Kurt Suzuki and company. So hopefully him now with getting up in age, he'll find more consistent at-bats, 162-game season, and he'll get back to the numbers that we've known him for uh, for those many years that he did in Cleveland and then, of course, in Washington. Continue to find more and more and more catchers to talk about coming out of Katua. That's exactly where we're going to continue next with Kirk Casale, a 2010 Cataleer once again, that championship team of the Cape Cod Baseball League. Had six home runs for himself in 2020, and Caught himself a pretty good game that I know the carries remember going back to that wild card series in 2020 against the Braves catching Trevor Bauer. But as well as Casale played, I know they, they will remember that one for the extra innings win that the Braves had eventually advancing past the Reds. But Casale started to put it together a little bit in the power department. What can we continue to see from him? So Casale is definitely um, the, the perfect example of a solid uh, veteran backup catcher. It's what he's been for a lot of his career. Uh, of course, with the Giants, you have uh, Buster Posey, who's been there for, for a long time. He's played at a high level there for a long time. So, of course, he's getting up there a little bit in age. He's probably not going to be able to play every day. So that makes a, 
Um, it makes it important for a guy like Kirk Casale uh, to be able to give them cons- consistent at bats. He certainly did with the Reds last season, right? Uh, just slugged 500 in, in that 31, 31 uh, in those 31 games in the abbreviated campaign. Split time with uh, defensive with really a defensive wizard, you could say, behind the plate in Tucker Barnhart. So I, I don't think you'll see him slogging 500 again, but I do think that um, he is definitely a high-end backup catcher. There's a reason why teams keep bringing him in to fill that role. And especially, and then if we see a guy, a top prospect like Joey Bart come to the majors this year, you, you're going to see Kurt Casale really co- go into that mentorship role with a guy like him. And um, so he, he's a very important part of that San Francisco Giants team for sure. And call me crazy, but I don't think anybody saw what Buster Posey is doing as what was going to be expected, right? He has been shaken up over the last couple of years after a collision at the plate. They started having him over at first base, but he looks really comfortable behind the dish. And Casale, you know, it's not the best situation to deal with. But when you have a backup that has caught such great pitchers, he learns their tendencies. And what I have to see is situational awareness, right? He can impart that on the young pitching staff in San Francisco and also really be able to anchor that advisory role to Bart if he comes up and help win some games when he gets the chance. The Giants have a really good catching core. They've got four catchers that are able to play at any point, any time, any day. Obviously, that's headlined by Buster Posey, who I believe took last season off. I mean, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but then put up those amazing numbers to start the beginning of this season. And you know that just being uh, the player that he is. Then you've got Kurt Casale, of course, Chadwick Trump, and then Joey Bart, the guy that everybody's looking forward to. But like you two said, Casale can be an anchor, fill-in guy. And with the Giants using Buster Posey, sometimes over at first uh, in interleague games, so bat DH, he's going to have a lot of reps to play catcher and have his average be up and do what he did in Cincinnati for the San Francisco giants. Mind you, I don't think they're vying for a playoff spot like the reds will be a uh, year in and year out now from a couple of years on, but still, he's still going to probably put the same numbers up that he did before and have a great position and opportunity to work under Buster Posey and teach Chadwick Trump. And of course, Joey Bart. If there is ever a player for our broadcasters to give their take on it, it's going to be our next former Kettleer going down to Atlanta and going to that Braves bullpen in A.J. Mitchell, who was absolutely sensational in 2020, just a .83 ERA over 21 and two-thirds innings, striking out 24, and was a huge piece of that Braves team that made a deep playoff run throughout the National League. Boys, what can you further tell us about the left-hander that started his time into it and now flourishing in that brace bullpen? Well, what I can tell you is when you stand out in, in a bunch of names like Mark Melanson, Shane Green, Will Smith, uh, Luke Jackson at times, glimmers of fantastic pitching – A.J. Minter has been consistent since he's come onto the scene with the Braves. Now, of course, we lose Mark Melanson as the everyday closer. The Braves are struggling to find who that's going to be, whether it's Will Smith, whether it's Luke Jackson. But A.J. Minter can step up into that role. You look at his numbers, 0.83 ERA in 2020, over 22 appearances and over 21 innings pitched. 2021, already four innings pitched and only one earned run in a 2.25 ERA. He's so consistent throwing from the left side. And I know that Snit loves him. We, liked, we like it when he comes out. Maybe he becomes the closer. Maybe he doesn't. But expect excellent work every time he touches the bump. And I think that we all can agree that we like relief pitchers that aren't deliberate, especially considering a lefty that loves to go right at hitters. His fastball is incredible. 97, 98 consistently out of the pen. He was a guy that early on, you just didn't know what type of player he was going to be. He was kind of roped in with the Jesse Biddles and the Patrick Weigels who he possibly could have been sent to the Brewers for that Orlando Arcia trade had he had not put up the numbers that he did last season. And now he is one of the staples of that bullpen. I love watching A.J. Minter pitch. He's been excellent since he played at Texas A&M, of course, for the Ketuit Ketaliers. And now Atlanta has a guy they're probably going to want to extend, and he loves pitching for the Braves, and he does such a wonderful job. And hopefully in their playoff push in 2021, he'll be a consistent person out of that bullpen for Atlanta that lost Mark Melanson and Shane Green. Yeah, not not too much more to add. I know the carries uh, were definitely excited to get to talk about AJ Minter. So, uh, but AJ Minter, like like uh, like both of the carries mentioned, 
has been a really solid reliever for them. Uh, a guy that uh, Brian Sn- uh, that Snicker could use in a high leverage spot whenever whenever he needed to. Of course, guys were thrown from the left side at 97, 98 miles an hour. They don't grow on trees, which makes Minter a really valuable guy, and he's going to continue to be thrown into those high leverage situations. You'll see him pitch in a lot of big games and a lot of in a lot of huge games with the Braves. You saw it last year, even in the playoffs in, in the NLDS and the NLCS as well. So Minter's going to keep being thrown into that role and he's done a great job so far and there's no reason to believe why he can't continue that. And now rounding out our list of the guys that we're going to talk about in terms of our kettle leaders in the show in 2021, last but certainly not least being Charlie Blackman out in Colorado, had a pretty solid season in 2020, the shortened 60 game season hitting just over 300 with six home runs and has been one of the staples in the National League, one of the best outfielders that we've seen come around as a 2005 Ketelier. As we round out the guys we're talking about in Major League Baseball from Ketua in 2021, what are you expecting from the Colorado center fielder? Well, Blackman's always been a great offensive player throughout his entire career. I mean, he's been a three, he's hit, he's hit over 300 for his entire career, which is no small feat. And of course, with an OPS uh, right around 860, um, nearing that 200 home run mark too, with a high of 37 home runs back in 2017. Uh, it's funny you think about Blackman last year he got off to such a scorching hot start that there was some talk if he could even finish the season at 400 of course that didn't happen uh, and, and he came back down to earth down the stretch but still put up a solid year like he has been uh, for for almost for a little over a decade now with the Colorado Rockies and he's going to be in there every day uh, for Colorado and a team that's in the Rockies that's that's being torn down. They're getting ready for a rebuild. Of course, they traded Nolan Arenado in the offseason. Trevor Story, you would think, uh, their star shortstop probably is finding a new home this offseason. Charlie Blackman, is he is a huge part of that Rockies lineup, and he will continue to be for the foreseeable future. Yeah, Blackman's just one of those guys, and not to use another Braves reference, but like Freddie Freeman prior to this season where he won the NL MVP, very underrated he flies under the radar does excellent work and almost is unrewarded for that work because he plays for the Rockies who haven't advanced to do very much but he comes and he brings you great effort every single day he puts out great numbers he's excellent defensively and he's been an all-star quite a few times in a market that doesn't necessarily pump out a ton of all-star talent Charlie Blackman could find success almost anywhere in the MLB and you could bet your bottom dollar on that I think the cloak of Nolan Arenado is finally beginning to fade for Charlie Blackman. And this season, people can notice him as the number one player for the Rockies. Of course, there's Trevor Story and McMahon at second base. And those guys are obviously incredible and do a lot for the Rockies. But Charlie Blackman, 303 career average. It's a lot different than what we saw when he was playing at Young Harris. 138 strikeouts and 127 innings in his freshman season. Uh, And then moving, of course, to Georgia Tech, which I'm not a fan of, uh, to now being just such an offensively oriented player, somebody who is so consistent like a Freddie Freeman and dependable. Charlie Blackman is truly a great player for the Rockies organization and Major League Baseball as a whole. So that'll do it for the Kettleers in the major leagues that we'll be previewing here on episode six of On Deck with the Kets. But as we go across Major League Baseball, it's always fun at this time of year to think ahead to October, think ahead to award season when we reach the end of the 2021 season. For that, So for that, to run us through the way too early prediction hour, I'll hand things over to our play-by-play man, Chris Carey. All right, guys. So you know how this works. We're all going to make our selections before I want to say – Full disclosure, I am not a Major League Baseball analyst. My opinions, if they offend you or if you think they're outright blasphemous, it is probably going to be true. So with that being said, we're going to analyze each division winner, uh, World Series champion, division champion, uh, league champion, and then, of course, the individual accolades, including Rookie of the Year and Cy Young, so forth and so on. So let's begin uh, with the American League because I'm a National League homer and I'd like to get them done second. Uh, Let's start with Tim and Will's favorite, the American League East. Who's going to win, guys? Well, I'll start it off because I I don't think Tim and Will need much time to think about who they think is going to win the American League East. But I think we've seen a ton of struggles with the Yankees um, in in terms of their pitching and their ability to finish out games late. Uh, I'm 
I'm pretty sold on, on the Toronto Blue Jays. And I know that's interesting. Um, they're kind of a dark horse team bouncing around from where they're going to play location to location. The Tampa Bay Rays, of course, making a World Series appearance in 2020. But I think the Blue Jays have all the pieces that they need to really be a great team in 2021. Yeah, I, I honestly, I'm not sure you guys were thinking I was going to go with. Uh, I, know, I know I am a Red Sox fan, but I do think the Yankees are going to come out on top in the American League East. I think there's too much talent there. I know they've gotten off to a rough start this season. You never know what the injury bug with them either. Uh, but I, I think there, there's too much power in that lineup. There, there's, there's just way too much talent. Uh, I, I like Toronto. I like Boston. I like Tampa. It's a, it's a good division, top from bottom, top to bottom. Maybe not the Orioles, but top one through four. It, it's definitely a good division. Uh, but I, I just don't see any way the Yankees don't come out on top in the American League East. And you know, as Yankee fans will tell you, this has got to be the year for them. Uh, it's World Series or bust. And I, I think eventually they will start to get it together in such a long season. And I think they'll take home the AL East crown. Which feels like it's been the narrative for them the last three or four seasons, doesn't it? But as we record, yeah, it's a little weird to see the Yankees in last place through the first week of the season. I don't see that being the case come the end of the season. I do believe they will come back to the top of the division as American League East champs. We know that the rotation, as it has been for the last couple of years, continues to be a concern. But the one thing that has shown is we know what Garrett Cole is going to be at the top of the rotation. We know that Corey Kluber, Jameson Tyone, both coming in. You're working those guys back up. So if they start a little slow, that's okay. You know what their ceiling can be. And you know that if you give them their innings, give them their worth, they'll start to come around by the summer. So in the meantime, who's going to step up? We expect to see Davey Garcia back at the big league level at some point. And Jordan Montgomery, who the Yankees have had, okay, when's this guy really going to start to come around? He's looked pretty darn good. Looked really good in his first start against the Orioles, going six innings, not allowing a run with seven strikeouts to just four hits allowed. That offense will certainly come around as long as Aaron Judge, and Carlos Stanton, if they can stay healthy, you have an elite bat at the top of the order in DJ LeMahieu. I fully expect the Bronx Bombers to be at the top of the division come the end of this season. You know what they say, great minds think alike, and you and Will thought the Yankees, I'm going to go with Steph's pick with the Toronto Blue Jays. People looked at me like I was crazy. I think this team has incredible depth. They added during the offseason with Marcus Simeon, the veteran presence there that they didn't have before, and the trio of Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Bo Bichette, the hometown kid from Orlando, Florida, and then Kevin Biggio uh, rounding out that big three is a big, important piece for the Toronto Blue Jays. They have pitching. Catching's a little iffy. But if they're going to win this division, they're going to have to play hard and finish out games. And in the small sample size, they've been able to do that thus far. Do I think it's going to be five to ten game difference uh, between the division of them and the Yankees? No, it may be one, one and a half. And the Blue Jays would be able to pull it out. But the Yankees obviously are a very competitive team. My pick is the Toronto Blue Jays as we move on to the American League Central. Stefan, you started things off last time. Who's your pick for the AL Central? Well, this is going to be one of the most interesting divisions to watch because I think everybody has seen what the Chicago White Sox can do. Bit of a slow start this season, but they have all the pieces that they need to be excellent. Um, but other teams to watch out for, and I'm not surprised to be saying this, the Kansas City Royals are going to hang around in that division. I don't think people give this team enough credit for what they can do. Um, and what pieces they've acquired, Andrew Benintendi. They have Jorge Soler, who's a great bat. But, yeah, I think definitively the Chicago White Sox are going to win the American League Central Division. You know, I, I, Steph, I do want to say before I get into my, my prediction for the champion, I do agree with you about the Royals. They've showed uh, they've, their lineup specifically. They can hit. They can hit. They, they've added some guys in the offseason, and they've looked good so far. I don't think they'll be in necessarily wild card playoff contention yet, but they're certainly on the right path. As far as, as far as my division champ, um, as I'm sure Tim is well aware of, I, I don't love the White Sox as much as a lot of people do. I, I don't think their, their rotation is built to last in the sense that I'm not a big uh, fan of Dylan Cease in the back end of the rotation. I and mean, Reynaldo Lopez, I believe, is at the alternate site right now. I like Lance Lynn at the top. I love Lucas Giolito. I think the rest of it is kind of iffy. Hopefully, Kopech can become a starter for them at some point this season. Uh, but I think a team that gets kind of underappreciated is the Minnesota Twins. I think they're going to win this division. They have, an, they have an outstanding lineup that can hit home runs from one through nine in that order. They've shown that. I mean, Nelson Cruz is – you're not going to find a much better hitter in all of baseball than Nelson Cruz. He's got to be a top, a top five, top ten hitter in the game. 
at the moment. And specifically at the top of the rotation, you have Berrios and Kenta Maeda. And Kenta Maeda has really established himself at the top of the Twins rotation. I think the Twins are going to take home the division close over the Chicago White Sox. The question for Will is just going to be, will they be able to get out of the first round of the playoffs? Should they be able to win the American League Central? I'm going to go with the White Sox, mainly because some of my early questions have been answered. Losing Aloy Jimenez for most of this season due to a torn pectoral certainly raised some eyebrows. You also have Tim Anderson going on the IL recently with a hamstring issue. So it was just a matter of who's going to be able to step in there. And your mean Mercedes, as we talked about earlier in the show, has been that force. Is a 556 average sustainable for the rest of the season? I don't think so. But with that kind of presence in the lineup to be able to fill in for your stars like Jimenez, for your guys like Anderson, you still have Luis Robert there as well. And I've liked what I've seen from the top of that rotation. Giolito has been great. That changeup is still one of the best pitches to watch in baseball. And when Lance Lynn starts to come around and drop in his complete game this week, I'm excited to see how this White Sox team finishes. I don't know if it was the best era style hire, but Will certainly knows that I have faith in Tony La Russa, and I'm going to take the White Sox to win the division. I'm going to go with Will's pick. I'm going to go with the Minnesota Twins. Before the season started, I was completely sold on the White Sox. I agree with everything Will said. The Twins are a power-oriented team. They've been able to fly under the radar. They've won plenty of games. They've got an amazing manager in Rocco Baldelli. I think that they're going to win. It will be close with the White Sox, but I think that they have a tremendous upside with the addition of Andrelton Simmons and a couple of pitching pieces as well. So we have to speed this up just a little bit. We move to the American League West. Not as much to talk about compared to these other two divisions. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's pretty cut and dry, at least from my perspective. There are going to be some good teams. The Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim are going to be great um, moving forward over the next couple of years with the pieces that they have. But as much as it, it pains me to say, I think the Houston Astros are going to win this division and find success in the postseason. Not very deep into the postseason, but I think that the Astros are going to win the AL West. Yeah, I'm going to keep this short and sweet. I think the Astros have established themselves pretty firmly as, I mean, they've got all, they're they're healthy again. Their lineup is outstanding. I think their rotation is better than people give them credit for. I think Grinke at at the top of the rotation is solid. And I think guys like Christian Javier, Framber Valdez when he gets healthy. uh, And of course, Jose Urquidy is a solid guy in their rotation as well. I think it's a good group. Uh, and despite despite with all the noise about the Astros, and I, I certainly am not a, not a huge fan of the Astros myself, but I do think they're pretty clearly the best team in the American League West. I expect them to win pretty comfortably. You certainly have to tip your cap to Dusty Baker and his crew. They've lost a lot of pieces over these last few off-seasons, and having to deal with the target on their backs following the cheating scandal over the last few years, they've been able to still find a way. People forget this is a team that was within a game of going to the World Series once again in 2020. I have them winning this division. I'm not saying this is going to be my prediction, what I'm about to say, but if we follow a five-year trend dating back to 2017, based on how their postseasons have gone, We'll see them beating the Yankees in the American League Championship Series and heading back to the World Series. That is a bold, bold statement from our senior media intern, Tim Crowley, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to go with the Astros. Keep it short and sweet. You guys have said enough. Uh, Unanimous votes, all four of us, just like four trash can bangs. We end out the American League uh, and head to the National League. Um, I'm going to start west to east because uh, I I can't since I'm the moderator. National League West, guys, quick round. Yeah, no, I think the Los Angeles Dodgers are going to be the victors of the NL West. And it's going to be close, but not as close as I think people are giving it credit for. Pedigree pedigree is a big thing. And I know I said that um, about the AL East and picked the Blue Jays over the Yankees, but the Dodgers experience is going to prove so crucial. They've been in this position. They have only gotten better, uh, adding Trevor Bauer to their rotation. And I think the Padres will be that wild card spot and they will easily be out in front for the first seed in the wild card spots, but the Dodgers are going to win the NL, NL West. Excuse me, man. I love me some San Diego Padres, but when you have a team like the Dodgers who a guy, when you have a David price, not being able to make the starting rotation and starting the year in the bullpen. I mean, that's all you need to know. The Dodgers are stacked from top to bottom, every position, their bullpen, their rotation. They're unbelievable. Uh, I love the Padres. I really hope they win that one game wild card because I want to see a playoff series between the two of them. But I think the Dodgers win the division pretty comfortably. This is still the Dodgers division to lose for at least one more year when Mike Clevenger comes back, also another Katoa alum. 
this could be a closer division in 2022, but for now, a team that won a World Series and only got better. David Price is back after opting out. You add Trevor Bauer, the rotation, as good as any in baseball. Still the Dodgers division to win in 2021 and probably the team that will be hosting probably what could be another commissioner's trophy come October. Yeah, I'll round out your guys' choices with the Dodgers. Uh, I agree with everything you guys said. I think it's going to be really close. Wouldn't be surprised if the Padres were able to steal it by some stroke of luck in 2021. But in 2022, I do believe the narrative and script is going to flip entirely to where the Padres are going to control the NL West. So now moving on to the National League Central, which has been kind of the league that's flown under the radar. Teams have gone in and out of being successful, not successful with the Cardinals, the Reds, the Brewers, and even the Chicago Cubs. Of course, the Pirates. We have one thing to look forward to with them, and that's Nick Gonzalez. Who's your pick for the National League Central? Well, and I think if you look at the teams that are in this division, there are four that really could make a case for an argument, less so with the Chicago Cubs because they've lost quite a bit. But, you know, the Reds made it to the playoffs last year. I don't know if I can stick with them in terms of winning this division. I think the Milwaukee Brewers are going to come out and win the NL Central Division. They have the power. They have the bats. And it looks like they're a hungry team that's ready to win and win this division. You know, with the addition of Nolan Arenado, it almost seemed like to me that the Cardinals were the only team that really was trying to make moves in the division in the offseason when everyone else was kind of selling off. Maybe not so much for maybe not so much on the Brewers side of things, but I think, I think the Cardinals with the addition of Nolan Arenado, who uh, stunningly like lots of people on social media saying has, is still a good hitter outside of cores on a crazy concept. He's still an elite hitter, even though he's not playing with the Rockies anymore. I think, I think the Cardinals they're deep in their lineup. Dylan Carlson has been off to a great start um, as a potential rookie of the year candidate. I think the Cardinals definitely win the NL central in my view. Cincinnati and Milwaukee have certainly tried to do their best to shake up that narrative to start the season. All the power that we've seen over in Cincinnati. And I like the Brewers starting rotation too. Corbin Burns has looked really good continuing over from that 2020 season that he had pretty solid. But I still think as the season rolls along, we're going to see the Cardinals start to pull away. That Arenado deal is going to be huge and we're going to continue to see him strive. I think Jeff Flaherty is going to have a major bounce back season. I'm excited to see how he's going to pan out and see if he can return to his 2019 form. But I'm going to stick with the narrative that as soon as Nolan Arenado became a St. Louis Cardinal, this officially became their division to lose. I think Cincinnati has actually gotten better in terms of their team. They lost Trevor Bauer in their pitching rotation, added a guy like Tyler Naquin, which was a huge upside add, and he's got off to a really great start since coming from the Cleveland Indians. Uh, I'm not going to take Cincinnati, as you guys said. I like Stefan's pick with the Brewers. There's just too many holes. They're a porous team in terms of what we've been able to see. I'm going to go with the St. Louis Cardinals and refer – to when I was nine years old, the St. Louis Cardinals broadcaster, Dan McLaughlin, telling Stefan and I, sweep the leg. I think the Cardinals are going to sweep the leg in 2021. So now moving on to my favorite division, and if it's not yours, your opinion doesn't matter, the National League East. <laughs> Guys, who's going to win the NLE? Stefan, I have a feeling I know which one you're going to go with. Yeah, I mean, this, this division is an enigma in terms of teams coming and showing what their abilities are. Early in the season, the Phillies – punched the Braves in the mouth, sweeping opening the opening series, showed great pitching, showed that their bats can compete. Top to bottom, their lineup is great. Mets off to a slow start, but I think this division, like um, Brendan Nemo said, is the Braves to lose. And until, like Ron Darling said, the Kings are decrowned and dethroned, the Atlanta Braves are going to be the winners of this, this division for a long time to come. Um, so my pick is the Atlanta Braves for the NL East. So I, I know you guys, uh, I know you guys on this call will certainly know where I'm going with this. I think the Atlanta Braves are going to win the NL East as well. Uh, the Mets made a lot of additions. Francisco Lindor was an awesome addition. I worry about this starting rotation. I, I think DeGrom is unbelievable. I think Strowman's is solid too, but Carras Carlos Carrasco is injured right now. Taiwan Walker uh, hasn't been the most consistent arm throughout his career. You're relying on guys like David Peterson as well at the back end of that rotation. I, 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 just, I just don't think the Mets have enough pitching from top to bottom. Uh, I don't think the they have the depth 
when the Braves, they do. I mean, I think the addition in my, and honestly, I think the addition of Charlie Morton was an absolute game changer for them. Absolute game changer. That gave them uh, that, that third elite arm. And I think when Mike Soroka comes back, I'm not worried about him uh, as far as his injury wise, because it was uh, an Achilles injury. Don't, I think he'll, I expect him to come back and almost become close to an ace that he can form into in the future. I think the Braves are in really good hands. I think they win this division, and I don't really think it's that close, to be honest with you. Despite being so close to City Field at Hofstra, despite my affection for a team that pre-COVID had the great deals, $10 tickets, free shirt Fridays, so much appreciation for this team. But I also recognize that my broadcasters would probably never talk to me if I didn't make this pick. <laughs> so I will join you in taking the Atlanta Braves full-heartedly in the National League East in 2021. Freddie Freeman coming off of an incredible MVP campaign. Ronald Acuna, one of the best players in baseball. Still so much fun to watch. The attributing pieces are there. Ozzie Albies still there. Travis Darno, I think if he can find himself once again and stretch out that postseason run across the full 162, still going to be able to make something happen behind the plate for the Braves. And I'm liking this rotation. Well, completely on point. I've been a big Charlie Morton guy for the last few years provides an incredible veteran presence and still a guy that has that big game pedigree. Max Fried was obviously terrific when he was on the Hill in 2020. Mike Soroka coming back is going to be great. And obviously the guy that I don't think I'm done talking about left yet on the show, Ian Anderson still going to be able to be one of the better young pitchers in baseball that we'll talk about for the Braves. Well, to finish it all off, I'm just going to state the obvious. The Atlanta Braves are going to win in 2021. <laughs> For the NL East, I think convincingly, like Will said, I don't think their biggest competition is in fact going to be the New York Mets. I don't, I, I don't know whether it will be New York or it will be Philadelphia. We saw that Philadelphia added some depth in terms of their bullpen, which was statistically the worst in major leagues last season. Uh, and now they're a little bit better. They had some trouble against Atlanta these past two games. We'll see how they do, of course, tonight, uh, depending on when you're watching. Um, but Atlanta the most electrifying team to watch in all of baseball, in my opinion. I think you've got six or seven guys that could be capable of being silver sluggers when they're on their day. Freddie Freeman leading that, Ronald Acuna Jr. getting off to the hot start that he needed to, uh, both defensively and offensively. Ozzie Albies, as you said. Charlie Morton proving that he's not going to be, hopefully, like a Cole Hamels one-and-done injury, and then you have to pay him $18 million. Uh, A good deal for him. Veteran presence helping out Max Fried, Mike Soroka, and, of course, Ian Anderson. The addition of Drew Smiley. If he can be consistent and under the radar and provide a back-end uh, positional up to the rotation, excuse me, then that's going to be good for Atlanta as well. Atlanta Braves, 2021 NL East champions. Sign it, stamp it, and send it. I think that's what it's going to be. So we've rounded out our divisions, guys. And now let's move to the league champions of Major League Baseball. We'll go back to the American League and start with Stephen Carey. Stephen, who is your pick for American League and uh, champions? Yeah, I mean, I think Will's analysis talking about the – or Tim's analysis, excuse me, talking about the trends that were going forward about the Astros beating the Yankees – in the championship series is on point. Um, I think that the Astros are a team that can really fight and they have that experience. The Yankees kind of falter late in the season. Um, and I know I didn't pick the Yankees to be my division champions, but it's very possible. And I do see the Astros having more success down the stretch than I do see the Blue Jays or the Yankees or perhaps any other contender. So I think that the Astros are going to win the American League. And I think the Braves will win the National League. You look at how their seasons have gone in the past, right? They lost the NLDS to the Cardinals. Then they go one game away from the World Series, losing the NLCS to the Dodgers. This team is hungry. This team is ready. And they've only gotten better and have more experience. It's going to be the Braves and I think the Astros as the division, uh, excuse me, the league champions. So I, I agree with you on the American League. I think I think the Houston Astros are going to come out of the American League. I think they, uh, like I mentioned in my first analysis, I think their pitching is a lot better than people want to give them credit for. Their lineup can mash from top to bottom. Now, not to mention their core is healthy, but you have a guy like Kyle Tucker who's been who's really emerged onto the scene and finally turned into what a lot of scouts thought he could be as he was coming up as a prospect. And so the Astros might have lost George Springer in the offseason, but I still think they are really, they're a really, really good team. 
And not to say that they'll necessarily finish with a better record than the Yankees in, 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 the, in the regular season, but I do think they are better set up to win a playoff series than the New York Yankees are. So I'm going to take the Astros in the American League and in the National League. I like the Braves, but I got to go with the Dodgers. Their, their, their starting rotation is just so insane. I, I, it's hard to pick against them. Uh, uh, hopefully we get another good series. I think, the, I think we'll get a Dodgers-Braves rematch, but I think the Dodgers will be coming out on top in that series. I need a year with the Braves get to the World Series. I really want to see this group get there and have a chance to win a ring. I don't think it's this year. I think the Dodgers got even deeper than they already were in 2020. I see them repeating as National League champs. And in the American League, I can't throw out that trend without backing it up myself. So I will go out. And again, it's hard to not, for baseball fans, for the, for the people that have had the morality across this game, it's hard not to block out, okay, well, the Astros did this. They're clearly not good anymore. Well, they found a way to still be that good. They've gone to – people might forget this too. This is still a team that's gone to four straight American League Championship Series. I think they make it five, and I think they take home their third AL pennant since their reign beginning in 2017. I've been wrong before, and I'll be wrong again, but this may be wishful thinking. I think that the American League will be the champion of – the Minnesota Twins will be the champions of the American League. Excuse me. I think that the Minnesota Twins are the best team in the American League. I think they're better than Houston. I think they'll compete with them head-to-head. I think they provide that nice balance of pitching and offense that competes against the Houston Astros. I think that they'll punch their ticket to the World Series. And then, of course, I believe the Atlanta Braves. They did something they haven't done in a very long time, and that's win a divisional series. Uh, You know, they've been – kicked out from St. Louis multiple times, and then, of course, beat the Reds and Miami and then moved to the league championship and was one game shy of the World Series. I think that they'll know what to do against the Dodgers when they play them this year and ultimately advance to the World Series. It does scare me, however, in Atlanta versus Minnesota World Series championship. Reminds me of 1991 where the Twins won 4-3, to three, and uh, it's, it's interesting to think about. But Braves-Twins is... My, my choice as we continue to move on to the World Series champion. So, Will, we'll ask you first, go over what you said again, and your champion of choice. So, I, my, my, uh, my two teams to, uh, to refresh were the Astros and the Dodgers. And, listen, the Dodgers are going to come in as the favorite. They are, uh, but I think they're going to have plenty of motivation let's just call it motivation for, for obvious reasons to really take down the Astros in their rematch. I think the Dodgers win. I think the Dodgers win in five games. uh, And I think they're back-to-back world series champions. Plenty of change since 2017, the first time these two teams met in a fall classic stakes, a little bit different. Some of the characters, the same, some of the characters, a little bit different, but it's still hard to pick against this Dodgers team. Like Drake said, they're going back to that. Well, I, you know, my bias for the Braves has come through <laughs> very clearly, and it's, it is very hopeful to assume that they can beat a team that top to bottom is as good as the Dodgers are. But like I said, if the Braves win the National League Championship Series, you're not going to run into a team that's better than the Los Angeles Dodgers. So with my pick, I would pick the Braves to be the World Series champions. But if I had to be a little bit more honest with myself, I think the Dodgers are the most likely favorites to win the World Series. Um, If the Braves can get past the Dodgers, then I think the Braves will win the World Series. If they can't, then I think the Dodgers will win pretty easily. Simply enough, Steph, I think the Atlanta Braves are going to beat the Minnesota Twins in six games. Uh, If they make it through against the Dodgers, if they don't, the Dodgers are going to beat whoever they play convincingly because the Dodgers are the best team in Major League Baseball. I don't think that they've been able to compete well when it comes to a full long season. We've seen how their playoff woes have shown out in years past, except the shortened abbreviated season in 2020. I don't know if they'll be able to continue that. And they're almost too stacked, too heavy. Braves bring a nice comparative competitive balance. And so do the Twins. It'll be a great thing to watch if it happens. I think the Braves have more power and better pitching. So now we move on to the uh, individual awards, starting with the Cy Young Award. So let's start with Tim on this one. Tim, who do you think is going to win the Cy Young for both the American League and the National League? 
I'm going to be boring for the National League. Jacob DeGrom continues to be the best pitcher in Major League Baseball, and I know that's going to appeal to a lot of the Mets fans that surround me here on Long Island. Continues to be the best. We have that fastball upwards of 100 miles an hour. can drop that slider in at 93, 94, maybe the hardest breaking ball in baseball. It's no question that's going to be Jacob DeGrom. And let's see who I can think of. For, you know what? I'll just throw it out there just because everyone's been on the craze. I don't even know if I believe this. Let's just say we, I'm going to go out to Anaheim. Shohei Otani is going to win this Cy Young this year. What? I just, wow. that, that is the only reason I made that pick, just to hear him make that reaction. Okay. All right. Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I agree with Jacob Degrom in the National League. Uh, I, I I love Degrom. I love Corbin Burns. I think he'll be up there, but I do think Degrom will take it home in the end. I think he. I, I want to see if he will be the first uh, the first guy to win National League Cy Young with a record of like eight and fourteen. We'll have to we'll have to see. That would be an impressive feat. Uh, and for the American League, I'm going to go Garrett Cole. I think I, I think Cole. Last year with the Yankees, he struggled with home runs a little bit, but his stuff has been really up to par so far. I think he runs away with it a bit in the in the American League. I really do. Yeah, I, I agree with all of your guys' opinions about Jacob deGrom. He's the best pitcher, I think, in baseball, and it's not close. Um, but in the American League, I like Shane Bieber. I like his ability. I like his pitching. I like how well he throws the ball, and I think that he will be the American League Cy Young Award winner. Um, during the full season. I think he has good durability and those will be my two picks for the Cy Young Award winners. Well, it is unanimous for Jacob deGrom for the National League. I wish that we would have Max Fried continuing and possibly being a Cy Young Award winner for the Braves. It's too early to tell on his part. He's pitched well. This season's gotten off to a little bit more of a slow start. Charlie Morton, of course, is a dark horse as well for Atlanta, but yeah, uh, Jacob DeGrom is absolutely the, the person to look for for the National League Cy Young winner. I think I'm going to have to go with the popularity vote here of Garrett Cole winning the American League. I like Shane Bieber. I like your analysis on that, Steph. But Garrett Cole, I think, will run away with the American League Cy Young Award with the New York Yankees. So now to move on to the Rookie of the Year, Tim Crowley, you start us off. I will start with a personal favorite of Will Thompson, and I'll show my Red Sox bias. For the first time on the show, I'll go with Bobby Dahlbeck playing first base for the Boston Red Sox. An elite power threat has all the power there. Just going to be cutting down on the strikeouts a little bit. We know it's been his big issue moving forward. He's had an interesting start to 2021, but I think you give him a full 162, he'll have time to develop, and I like Dahlbeck in the American League. So I think for the, for the American League, uh, I think considering the fact that Randy Rosarena is still technically a rookie, uh, he's off to a great start this season after his unbelievable 2020 postseason. You know, he, he's, you know, he is still technically considered a rookie. Therefore, I think he's going to win the American League Rookie of the Year. Well, if we're sticking with American League, I agree with Will's analysis 100%. Randy Rosarena is one of those generational talents that really emerged out of nowhere. He had the 23 hits in the postseason, which was a major league record. And it's only going to translate well during, over the course of a full season. I think Randy Rosarena wins Rookie of the Year. I agree with Will and Steph. Randy Rosarena, 10 home runs in the postseason. That's another record that he holds without taking uh, basically a major league at bat. He is a rookie. He will win, I think he will win Rookie of the Year for the American League as we move on to the National League now, Tim. I'm going to play to, play to my Braves fans just a little bit, and I'm going to go out and say that my guy down in Atlanta, Ian Anderson, will take home the 2021 National League Rookie of the Year. I think he's one of the most exciting pitchers to watch in terms of the young guys across this league, has a plus fastball up to 96-97, has a developing breaking ball, and in my opinion, the most fun change up to watch has an incredible mix of speeds you don't see too many guys rely on that fastball straight change up combo much anymore and to see Ian Anderson have some pretty good success with it early in his career I love watching him pitch and I very much look forward to watching him take home the National League Rookie of the Year award in 2021. Yeah, so I mentioned him. I mentioned my pick earlier in the show. I really like him. I think Do Dylan Carlson's going to take it home in the National League. St. Louis Cardinals outfielder is an elite prospect coming up. 
Uh, you struggle in a little bit in the batting average department to start, but the power is certainly there. I think he'll, I think he'll start to figure it out. He'll start to make a little bit more contact as he gets used to major league pitching. And I think Dylan Carlson in a very competitive NL rookie of the year race. Of course you have key Brian Hayes and a guy dark horse, I think for the San Diego Padres, ha Sung Kim coming over from the KBO and the key womb heroes. I think he's going to, I think, I think there's a it's possibility that he could sneak into that conversation as well. I really like him. But I do think Dylan Carlson will take it home in the National League. Then I'm going to go with Ian Anderson. Uh, he has been a staple and a stable arm in the Braves rotation. Does nothing but strikes guys out. So much poise for the age that he is coming out of New York. We really like him here in Atlanta. And I think that he could be the NL Rookie of the Year this year. And my pick is not an Atlanta Brave to anybody's surprise. But uh, Jonathan India is my pick. Uh, Matt Powell, our social media intern, is a University of Florida former baseball player. He's going to get a kick out of me picking Jonathan India. But I haven't seen a second baseman go on this type of stretch, hitting in basically every game he's played in since coming up and actually coming up for the first time uh, here in 2021. So Jonathan India is my pick for Rookie of the Year in the National League. So finally, guys, we move to the ultimate singular positional award major league baseball most valuable player we're going to do it in the order of will tim myself and then steph wants to close it out i don't think it would be any other way to finish off this amazing show that we've had with you guys than to talk about the two mvps just give us your two and we'll get on the road with it so uh in the american league i'm gonna go mike trout he's amazing i don't have to give a whole speech about how incredible mike trout is I think he sometimes goes overlooked a, a little bit in, this, in the terms of MVP race. People want somebody new, but I think Mike Trout will have such a good year that it'll be impossible to ignore. I think he'll take it home in the American League. Unfortunately, in the National League, my, my, my preseason pick was Fernando Tatis Jr. of the San Diego Padres. Unfortunately, with his shoulder injury, he's going to be out uh, at least a month or two. I, so I, I think that'll be enough to put him out of the race. So you know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Christian Yelich. I'm gonna go Christian Yelich. He had a tough year last year. I think he's gonna start to turn it up this year and go back to what we knew he was going to be. Hopefully, he can stay healthy. I know in his last year, uh, I believe back in 2019, when it was a two horse race between him and Cody Bellinger for the NL MVP. He ended up getting hurt in, in the beginning of September. That kind of took him out of the race. So hopefully he stays healthy. But I think Christian Yelich is going to take home the NL MVP. Similar to my National League Cy Young pick, I'm going to be boring again. It's a tough pick against Mike Trout in any year. And now that he's starting to get a little bit of a supporting cast around him in Anaheim, especially with Otani finding his way back to the plate. We talked about Jared Walsh earlier in the show. I think that's going to take even just a little bit of pressure off of Mike Trout and allow him to continue to raise his game. I have him winning the American League MVP. And in the National League, Talked about him earlier in the show, finding a little bit of a change of scenery. I think Nolan Arenado is going to really benefit from heading to St. Louis. Has a great lineup around him. I see him taking home the NL MVP in 2021. For my American League MVP award vote, I'm not one for the flashy, obvious pick. Um, And you'll hear about that for my National League one as well. But I think Shohei Otani out on the limb is going to win the American League MVP if he stays healthy. I think he's a guy that can absolutely throw a sub three ERA on a full season, also hit over 270 with 20 plus home runs and be a guy that can do it on both sides of the ball that we haven't seen before in the game's history, uh, of course, to the modern era. And then to the National League, I'm going to be a homer once again. I'm this guy's biggest critic. I don't think that he is even the best player on this team, but I think this year he will be better than everybody and shine brighter than everybody else. And that's Ronald Acuna Jr. I think that if he stays healthy and consistent, he's got a chance at going for that 40-40 season, which he's been chasing for three years now. And Ronald Acuna Jr. with Shohei Otani, what better two MVPs to represent the game than those two? Yeah, I'm going to agree with Chris's pick, or should I say my pick, because we were talking about this a couple of days ago in the car with Shohei Otani winning the MVP. I don't see how you can make an argument against him if he gets you 10 wins and bats above 250. When In, a, in an era where wins above replacement is so important, he plays multiple positions. He has a great bat. He is literally a win generator. Um, so that's that's something that could be interesting to watch out for. And in the National League, I think Bryce Harper comes across with 
the MVP in the NL. He has been very consistent throughout his career, and he's always a big threat, especially against National League opponents. I'd like to see him just take that next step, win the MVP for the Phillies, and probably spearhead some type of mid, mid to late season uh, run where they become a wild card team or perhaps even win the division if they could put it all together. So you've heard from all of us. We've talked about the Cataliers that you can keep your eyes on all across the 2021 season. And now you have all, all of our picks for individual awards and who will be taking home the commissioner's trophy in October. We're going to see how we do. Will we do well? We'll come back to this in November and see how these all turned out. But that'll do it for episode six of On Deck with the Cats, the special major league preview for 2021. For Will Thompson, for Stephen Carey, for Chris Carey, I'm Tim Crowley. And for the next time we see you on On Deck with the Cats, could be some exciting things ahead as we get just inside two months of Cape League opening day.